If you're a discerning, open-minded, and dedicated seeker who loves a good deep dive into the nature of reality and consciousness, then do check out my book, The Grand Illusion, composed of over 10,000 hours of research and experience. Find more information and reader reviews at brendandmurphy.com slash TGI. All right, welcome, ladies and gents, to this episode of Truthiverse. I'm Brendan, your host, and I have the pleasure of being joined this week by author Michael Cremo, who has authored a book with Richard L. Thompson. Uh, they're both quite well known for it. It's called Forbidden Archaeology, Forbidden Archaeology. And uh, he's an expert, Michael is an expert in extreme human antiquity and human origins with some very interesting research material we're going to dive into. I have a list of uh, things I want to touch on. Um, hopefully we'll have time to get through it all. But yes, Michael should need no introduction. Uh, mate, thanks for joining me for, for a chat. Great to be with you and all your listeners and viewers. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure. And um, let's let me if if I can, I'm going to just pull up my notes here. I'd like to ask you how you you for those who don't know your work that well, um, who might be listening to this, you have a, a very interesting for for someone who's operating in such a kind of an academic scholarly kind of capacity. You have an unusual kind of a anchor anchor point for this. Your general uh, philosophical outlook or spiritual outlook is very heavily informed by the Vedas. Yes, uh, that's a fact. Uh, and uh, that has something to do with the way I grew up. Uh, my father was an intelligence officer for... Uh, the American military, and that meant a, a few things for me as I was growing up. One thing it meant was I was moving around to a lot of different places and got exposed to a lot of different worldviews. I learned you know, very quickly that what I regarded as the American way of looking at things wasn't the only way to look at things. There are people with other cultural backgrounds and heritages that also have views about the nature of reality and what the purpose of life is. So I got exposed to those things. And another thing I, I grasped growing up among people working in intelligence and counterintelligence and things like that is that there are things about the world, things that are happening that many people simply aren't aware of because it's uh, not made accessible to them. It's classified information, you could say. So uh, among the different worldviews that I came in contact with when I was growing up, was the spiritual culture of ancient India. And I, I found some interesting insights in that that made a lot of sense to me. For example, the idea of reincarnation. You know, traveling in Europe and other countries, I would sometimes go to a place and feel I've been here before, things like that. So... I became attracted to those ideas, and I began studying uh, some of the writings of that worldview. And in these writings, which date back thousands of years, there were accounts of human civilizations existing on this earth millions of years ago. And it's something that you find in a lot of the ancient wisdom traditions, this idea that humans have been here for a long time, longer than modern scientific theories and some interpretations of the Bible, for example, would allow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I began to wonder, well, is there any truth to that? Or is it simply mythology? So I began looking into the history of archaeology, and I didn't find any evidence for such things in the current textbooks. But because I suspected, well, maybe if I look 
beyond the textbooks at the original scientific reports of archaeologists, geologists, other scientists digging into the earth, that I might find something interesting. And maybe that that comes from the intelligence exposure to intelligence work. So I began uh, looking into that, uh, going back to the original scientific reports uh, of the past uh, 150 years or so. Uh, and when I did that, I was surprised to find many reports by professional archaeologists, other earth scientists, published in the professional peer-reviewed scientific literature of their time that made uh, a pretty good case that there is evidence in the form of human bones, human footprints, human artifacts going back very far in time. So uh, if I hadn't had an alternative to what my teachers in high school and university had taught me, I wouldn't have had any real reason to question what the current dominant consensus in the scientific world says hmm. about human origins. So, yeah, you're right. I, I have been influenced in my work by a perspective from the Vedic culture of ancient India, yes. Yeah. Um, and I would just as a side tangent there, I, I thought to ask you, you know, your, exp your exposure to the uh, intelligence side of things as a, you know, as a young man growing up or a youngster growing up, did that ever, um, did any of what you were exposed to ever have a direct uh, connection to this work that we're talking about? Or was it more just the general kind of impression that the exposure to different types of information and perspectives had on you? Yes, I think it was more of a, a general impression because what they were dealing with at at the time that I was kind of around around uh, people in that community was uh, the Cold War, basically Russia and the United States, you know, photographs, satellite photographs of uh, movements of Russian troops in Eastern Europe, positions of uh, miss anti-missile uh, platforms in East Germany and other frontline countries, Czechoslovakia, Poland, places like that that were under Soviet domination at the time. So there wasn't anything directly connected with archaeology involved in it. But uh, as I became involved in looking at the history of archaeology, I could kind of see similar types of things going on. Um, that there was a, a lot of information that was accumulating that wasn't passing through what I call a, a knowledge filter. Yes. Yeah. And and I was going to ask you about all of this. So please, I mean, please do continue because suppression in, in this realm is has been rampant. And, you know, that knowledge filter has been very, very effective, it seems, to a large extent. Well, uh, we all do knowledge filtration. You know, we don't necessarily accept everything that we read in a social media post or even believe, you know, sometimes they said seeing is believing, but, you know, we have to filter what we see, and we all do that, and uh, scientists, of course, also do it, but uh, what's problematic is when someone judges evidence or any type of communication and uses a, a double standard. In other words, they don't treat everything according to the same standard. You know, it's like if you had a policeman and 
you know, for some person, you know, he just, well, yeah, he was going a couple miles over the speed limit, but I, I won't, I won't give him a ticket or her a ticket. And uh, someone else who, for some reason or another, he doesn't like, whether it's because of a factor like race or nationality or whatever. And if they even slightly violate the speed limit, they're ticketed or arrested, put in jail, tried. You know, it's uh, you know, like a, a, a double standard. If they apply the law equally, fine. You know, but... Uh, so sometimes that happens in the knowledge filtering process. And this isn't something that I've invented. There have been no. uh, historians of science, philosophers of science like Thomas Kuhn, who wrote a very famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Mm -hmm. He was the person who came up with and popularized the term paradigm. Mm -hmm. You know, that there, sometimes there are paradigm shifts. Uh, a paradigm is a set of understandings and methodologies that practitioners of a certain science use uh, to evaluate evidence that comes in, into their uh, sphere of attention. And evidence that conforms to the accepted paradigm will be accepted. Uh, but evidence which may be just as good in quality in terms of the research that happens to fall outside what the paradigm permits will be filtered out. And uh, sometimes the filtering is done in such a way that you know, if it fit the paradigm, uh, then it's, it should still pass through because the quality of the research and the qualifications of the researcher are equivalent to the evidence that's accepted within the paradigm. So, uh, so that... What that means is that sometimes in a science, this happens so many times that you get this huge body of evidence that's been documented, but not considered or included, and it goes against the paradigm. If it, if it reaches a certain level, it... Uh, can cause a shift in the paradigm so that the evidence becomes incorporated. So I think in archaeology, we're kind of in a stage like that where anomalies are accumulating. And at a certain point, uh, people aren't going to be able to ignore that. You know, you can say, okay, we filtered this one out. We'll get to it later. You know, we'll, we'll eventually find some way of accommodating it or dismissing it. Mm -hmm. But if they're not able to do that and these anomalies keep accumulating, then a change could come in the paradigm. It seems, it seems like we're gathering momentum in that direction. Is that your impression that it's actually the paradigm is shifting? Uh, yes, and it's for different reasons. Uh, one thing that causes paradigms to change is that the supporters of the old one die. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in other words, that that happens. And Another thing that happens is that just general social and cultural understandings change somewhat, and this influences what people are prepared to do. For example, in archaeology, there are archaeologists who are very much aware that their 
science, archaeology, which is part of anthropology, was used in colonial times to suppress the identities and worldviews of the colonized people in Asia, Africa, South America, other places. And therefore, they're prepared to accept, well, there may be different archaeologies, Western, scientific, uh, objective, reductionistic archaeology, that's one archaeology, but there may be an Australian Aboriginal way of looking at archaeology or a Native American Indian uh, way of looking at archaeology. And that's quite a prominent group these days. And uh, in other words, you have two basic groups in archaeology, what I call the archaeology group, which is the group that says Western, modern, scientific archaeology is the only one worth considering, and everything else is just nonsense. Uh, there are others, the other group, the second group, I call the archaeologies group, plural, and they're prepared to recognize uh, the epistemological or cognitive independence and equivalence of indigenous archaeologies, archaeologies of different tribal peoples, things like that. And as a matter of fact, uh, the journal, the academic journal published by the World Archaeological Congress is, I don't, know, I don't know if you can hear that. That's a feature of living in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, I heard a little bit of something, gotcha. Yeah. On Venice Boulevard, which is outside my window. I don't have a soundproof studio. Yeah, no, no worries. So occasionally there are interruptions like that. So, well, the, the point I was making is that there are some archaeologists who are prepared to recognize different archaeologies and respect them. So the one organization of archaeologists that subscribes to that view is the World Archaeological Congress, which is one of the world's largest international organizations of archaeologists. And the journal, the scientific journal published by that group is called Archaeologies, plural. And they're interested in archaeologies based on non-Western epistemologies and ontologies. Now, epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with how do we get knowledge? And ontology is the branch of philosophy that deals what really exists in the world. So the archaeology group tends to believe that the only way to get knowledge about the world, its past, its present, its future, is their method, you know, which relies on an ontology that basically only matter, gross physical matter exists. Whereas these other archaeologies are based on other ways of receiving or obtaining knowledge about the past, maybe by oral traditions, perhaps by uh, sacred writings, and also by what you can find in the layers of the earth. So, uh, yeah, there's some variety there. And the knowledge filtration process will operate differently according to the perspectives that they have. So I said, we all do knowledge filtration. 
But we should, if we're going to be honest and ethical, should apply, acknowledge what our filter is. Like I acknowledge, okay, I have uh, some commitments to a particular worldview that makes sense to me and which I think can be rationally discussed with others who may not be uh, following that particular path. But uh, uh, what, what I don't agree with is if someone has a particular bias and they don't even acknowledge it, they more or less assert that they have no, uh, no bias, no particular commitment to any uh, particular way of looking at things. And then they apply, apply, apply whatever their unacknowledged commitment is in a, in a way that can be demonstrated to be uh, unequal. <laughs> you know, they, they give a very strict application of whatever standards they're applying to things that violate their own personal conclusions and are very lenient with things that uh, support their conclusions, even though if they were fair, they would have to reject not only what uh, doesn't, according to their way of looking at things, go along with their paradigm and the evidence that they cite, if they treated it in the same way, also would not support their paradigm. Mm -hmm. And even beyond that, uh, there's another dimension to things is that when people use some authority such as government, uh, say through its education policies, to compel others to accept their conclusions, more or less by fiat, you know, that I don't like. If someone listens to what I'm saying and, and disagrees with that, I respect that decision. I don't expect everyone will agree with everything that I say. And <clears throat> uh, I think everyone has that freedom to make up their own minds about uh, the questions that we're talking about or any any matter, really, you could say I'm kind of a libertarian in that sense. Mm -hmm. But um, if somebody is going to use government or some other type of social mechanism to compel others to accept what they dictate, uh, that that isn't something that I agree with. No, and it's usually done when what they're trying to shove down our throats is mm, destructive or at, at the very least, you know, inaccurate and not correct. Um, and they, that's when they, you know, resort to force and coercion and this kind of stuff, uh, which we've seen a lot of the last few years. Um, and speaking of this knowledge filter that you're outlining here, um, there was, uh, it seems to have been some key moments in the timeline of, you know, modern um, science where it's become more entrenched and more structural. Um, you know, I, I remember you talking about Java Ape Man um, and the way this fitted or didn't fit into the timeline, the way they, they built the Darwinian timeline such that anything that didn't fit that was filtered out, just shoved under the rug. And you've talked about Dr. Ribeiro. Um, so, yeah, there, there seem to have been some very important moments and events where that, that has become very entrenched. Yeah, the discovery of Java Man in the late 19th century was a key event. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species. 
And although he didn't directly address the question of human origins, he did say as a general principle that the species we observe today have evolved from more primitive species. So scientists involved in the study of human origins immediately came to the conclusion, well, this means humans like us must have evolved from some uh, more primitive type of hominid being, ape-like being. And they began searching for evidence for that, for a the, the fossils of a creature intermediate between modern humans and ancient apes who existed millions of years ago in Africa, they thought. And they were looking for this missing link. Uh, now they searched for it in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And the interesting thing is that they weren't finding evidence for a missing link. They were finding evidence that humans like us were existing millions of years ago. Now that changed in the uh, around 1894, I think it was, when a, a Dutch researcher, Charles Dubois, no, Eugene was his first name, Eugene Dubois, found a thigh bone and a skull cap in an excavation at a place called Trinil, which was in Java, which at that time was under Dutch rule. Dubois was a Dutch citizen who'd gone out there, uh, took a, a position as a medical doctor, but he, uh, he was interested in finding fossil evidence for the missing link, as they called it at that time. And at Trenel, he did find uh, a, a very primitive ape-like skull cap, you know, the top part of a skull. And it had very prominent uh, ridges eye ridges above the place where the eyes would be. It was very thick. And along, along with it, not directly beside it, but about uh, 50 feet away, he found a thigh bone that looked a little bit human. So he put the two together and said, well, here's the Java ape man who he gave the name Homo, uh, not Homo, Pithecanthropus erectus. Now it's called Homo erectus, but he called it Pithecanthropus erectus. And Pithica means ape, Anthropo means human. So he proposed, well, this is the missing link that we've been looking for. And it became widely accepted in the world of science. Now, it was found in a formation about 800,000 years old. So we can say it's less than a million years old. So the problem became, if we accept this, then what do we do with all the evidence that accumulated over the past three or four decades you know, human bones, human artifacts, showing that humans like us lived way before that. That's the, the time that that evidence, which had been previously accepted by scientists, displayed in museums and given ages uh, of many millions of years, then that began to disappear. And after that time, when anyone discovered anything more like that, it was 
suppressed in the in the in the sense that it was either dismissed as a mistake or a hoax or it was misinterpreted and the correct interpretation would fit it in you know that that, that for you know for example if they found uh, a a bone that appeared a certain way to suggest that anatomically modern humans were existing before a million years ago, they uh, they would uh, interpret it in such a way that well, they, it was the formation was misstated; it had slipped down there through a fissure, or there was some earth movement. Or something. I mean, the, the the basic idea they had at that time, uh, accepting Java man, which was not human, it was intermediate between humans and ancient apes. They thought humans uh, didn't come, humans like us didn't come into existence until about 40,000 years ago. Uh, a little later in the 20th century, they thought 100,000 years. Now they say maybe about 300,000 years. Uh, so let's say someone finds, and this has happened. And you know, for example, in 2016, there was a team of archaeologists working at Ulduvai Gorge in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. It's a very famous place. A lot of prominent discoveries have been made there. They found a bone. Uh, it's not a big bone. It was like this uh, bone here, you know, like there are three bones and a finger. So on this little finger, this proximal phalanx, you know, the first bone in the f little finger of, of this hand is what they found. Seems like a small discovery, but it, you know, there's something very interesting about it. They compared the bone that they found to the same finger bone, to fossils of the same finger bone of different apes, monkeys, uh, different hominins, different types of ape men like Australopithecus and Homo habilis and Homo erectus. And they also compared it with the same finger bone as in anatomically modern humans, humans like us. And they found it fit, you know, they did, you know, 30 or 40 measurements on it. You know, they have complex statistical analysis methods for evaluating the shape of bones when they compare them to each other. And they found that their fossil that they had discovered fit in the modern human range of expression. And it was different from apes, monkeys, Australopithecus, other ape men or hominins as they're called. And the thing is, it was found in a formation that was 1,870,000 years old. So what they said about it in their peer-reviewed scientific report that was published in uh, Nature, they said uh, this finger bone, this fifth manual proximal phalanx, as they called it, uh, this finger bone is most like modern Homo sapiens, but we can't call it Homo sapiens because of its age. In other words, they say, well, humans didn't exist at that time. So although it's human, it's 1,870,000 years old, it, we can't call it that. Now, 
I say, well, why, why not? Other than your commitment to this paradigm, you know, if a human like us did exist at that time and left a finger bone, that finger bone there, that's exactly what you would expect to be finding. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's how the knowledge filtering process works. They don't, the scientists who wrote this didn't think, I'm engaging in knowledge filtering. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to suppress evidence, which if known would cause people to uh, disbelieve in our theories. In other words, it's not a conspiracy in the sense that most people think about such things. Say, wow, we found this. It doesn't fit. You know, if people know about this, they'll dismiss all our theories and all the textbooks will have to be rewritten. They just think we're being responsible scientists. I mean, everyone knows, at least that they know, you know, and, and take seriously as far as they know human beings didn't come into existence any earlier than 300,000 years ago and they just think well yeah we we can't call it it's interesting it looks human you know there must have been some type of hominin that existed at that time that had these human features and you know, that's how we explain it. Mm -hmm. and, but the effect is, if, if that, because that hasn't happened just one time, it happens a lot, you know. And so if you say, well, maybe humans existed millions of years ago, and they'll say, well, there's no evidence for that. The reason there's no evidence for that is these kinds of things happen not once or twice, but dozens of times, hundreds of times. And nobody's thinking, I'm suppressing evidence. Mm. But the effect is the same as if they were, because we don't get all the facts that we would really need in order to make reasoned judgments about questions like human antiquity yeah and it looks it just ends up being kind of it's their blind commitment to their their accepted paradigm and, and to them when they see that kind of that evidence those anomalies it's it's already in their minds it's already defined as an impossibility so it can't be possible it's not possible because we're only this old and you know that that whole paradigm tells them no it's not possible so yeah, this unconscious filtration and suppression of information. And 1.8 million years isn't even uh, at the extreme end of the scale, is it? No, it isn't. Uh, actually, if you look at all of these cases, which I made a comprehensive collection of in Forbidden Archaeology, which is about 900 pages long, in other words, there's enough of this evidence to fill up a 900-page book. And there's pro that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's potentially a lot more. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, yes, and it goes back, you know, for example, the, the California gold mine discoveries uh, where... Uh, human artifacts and human skeletal remains were discovered in places like Table Mountain in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. Uh, they were found in formations about 50 million years old. And, you know, some of them, they were discovered originally in the 1880s. And you know, the chief government geologist of California, a Harvard University educated geologist named J.D. Whitney, uh, announced them to the scientific world in a publication that came out from Harvard University in 1880. He, uh, he, he was later dismissed. Other scientists 
who were perhaps in more powerful positions than he was. Uh, I'm talking about scientists like anthropologist William Holmes, who said, if, if, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of evolution as we understand it today, he, he wouldn't have announced those discoveries. He, he would have known they can't possibly be true because they're earlier than Java man. You know, we're kind of getting back to that question, the significance of, of that discovery. This is a perfect example of how it was used to dismiss evidence that showed fully, fully anatomically modern humans existed before the so-called missing link, Java man. So, uh, yeah, and then there are reports of evidence that go even further back in time than that, you know, we're, we're talking about hundreds of millions of years. So, of course, as you go further and further back in time, there's less evidence that survived until the present. Hmm. And because there are things that are going on, plate tectonics and things like that, that actually destroy uh, fossil bearing layers, they get eroded away, subducted, and things like that. So there's a kind of natural process, geological process mm -hmm. of knowledge filtering. But yeah. uh, but there are cases that do go back very far, you know to the hundreds of millions of years. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to run through a few of these, um, if, if you don't mind. Let's let's talk through some of these particular discoveries, for instance, and I'll start with the ones that aren't quite as extreme, like uh, the modern human footprints discovered, again, Laetoli in Tanzania, estimated 3.7 million years old. That's right. Well, that's really good that you're taking steps backward in time. Um literally their <laughs> footprints and they're older than say the finger bone that was found in, uh, in Tanzania also. Yeah, the Laetoli footprints are interesting. They, uh, according to Mary Leakey, who was the discoverer, the scientist who originally reported them, the footprints are exactly like modern human footprints. And other scientists also agree, like Tim White, who was a paleontologist. He said, they're like modern human footprints. They're just like the footprints that you or I would make if we were walking on a beach today. And uh, so how did they explain the footprints? because they didn't believe that humans like us were existing 3.7 million years ago. So they said, well, there must have been some type of ape man, some type of hominin, as they're called technically, uh, that existed at that time and had feet exactly like modern human feet, but a body that was more ape-like. So, uh, that's an interesting proposal, <laughs> but, you know, scientists have found, archaeologists, paleontologists have found the physical remains, the, the fossil bones of, of the hominins that existed three to four million years ago in Africa. Uh, mostly they're members of the Australopithecus species. And the foot bones of Australopithecus have been discovered. And the foot of Australopithecus was not like that of a modern human being. For example, it had a, a, a large first toe, kind of like a human thumb, 
that could move out to the side like this. Mm -hmm. And it also, its other toes were kind of long, sort of like little human fingers. So the Laetoli footprints don't look like they were made by that kind of a foot. Mm -hmm. Actually, the only creature known to science that has a foot just like that of a modern homo sapiens like us is a human being like us. You know, so. And and outside of Africa, there's also been some interesting discoveries as well. Um, uh, something in Hap Habsburg, Habsburg, England as well. Yeah. I'm not sure how that is pronounced in England. Neither am I. <laughs> Haberg, Haberg or something. I, 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 I don't know, but it's spelled hop, according to American pronunciation. It would be Hoppiesburg. But yeah, uh, fairly recent years, uh, archaeologists discovered a series of footprints that was on some uh, layer of stone on the shore of, I think it's the ocean. And uh, Erosion kind of exposed these footprints in this layer of stone. And the archaeologists dated them as being about 800,000 years old. And uh, they took cast and digital impressions of the footprints and began to study them. And they found they matched anatomically modern human footprints, uh, those of uh, tribal people like Eskimos and Native American Indians. And uh, again, you know, the, the same kind of knowledge filtering process takes place. They were exactly like footprints made by living populations of anatomically modern humans, but they couldn't attribute them to anatomically modern humans because they didn't exist, according to their way of looking at things, 800,000 years ago. So who was, according to their theories around at that time, was a being that they call Homo antecessor, who was you know, not like an anatomically modern human, perhaps more like uh, a variety of Homo erectus. So uh, again, uh, I, I would say what they actually found was evidence that that humans like us were present in England about 800,000 years ago. But, but if you look in the textbooks, what it'll say is, well, there was some type of ape man who had feet like anatomically modern human feet, it's not totally human, of course. You know, the body and the head were more ape-like. And it fits their paradigm. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it really contradicts their paradigm. And it's uh, an example of how they take evidence that could just as well be interpreted as evidence for a human presence, but they make it fit their paradigm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, again, that unconscious sort of bias that's just programmed into them. And I guess, you know, the education system is, it, it's it's so key in, in maintaining that status quo. But, you know, you get these young impressionable minds, they come into the system and they go into one of these educational institutions, establishments, and they think they're going to be given the truth of what happened and what is. And uh, unfortunately, you know, that attitude of, well, this is the truth, uh, doesn't lend itself to a great deal of uh, flexibility later on when they encounter things that don't fit. Yeah, well, I, I think 
it's not presented to them exactly that way. It's nice to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's presented as, okay, we are the experts. Yes, yes. In this. We're recognized by the government. We get grant money from them. We're in an educational institution that's financed by them. You have to trust us. Exactly. Trust the experts. As we trust ourselves, you know, because they've gone through the same process. Where they learn, we have a method here. Mm -hmm. It's called the scientific method. And it's proven to be the best method for getting an objective picture of what reality is. This is not like some faith or doctrine of some religious sect. This is not like some totalitarian system that's being imposed by force on it. We, we've we gone through the training. We've done, we've paid our dues. We've come up with this and it's it could change at any time because of more discoveries. It's sort of presented like that. Although if you really analyze it, it's not exactly like that, but they're kind of convinced of it. Mm. That uh, what we've got here is the best way of understanding such things. And here are the conclusions that we've reached yep. by this method. Yeah. You know, it, if you buy into that, you don't think you're engaging in a knowledge filtration process. No. You'd be quite insulted if somebody asserted that and you would either uh, retaliate in some way against the person or ignore them, which is usually the first step. Uh, but it's kind of the way our society has developed. But I think the kind of skepticism that we apply to other uh, people in society, you know, for example, if a government official says something, don't automatically accept it. You know, reporters question it, people question it on the social media. You know, they, you know, or even the medical profession, it used to be kind of sacrosanct, or the, the church officials. They, they get questioned, but the scientific uh, spokespersons haven't really been subjected to the same kind of critical examination as other groups in society. Mm. And, you know, that, that gives them a, a certain amount of influence. But if one looks very carefully and one does have to look very carefully sometimes in order to detect these things in a way that can be thoroughly documented and stand up to scrutiny so uh, things are sometimes uh, not as clear as one would like, but uh, in general, I, I would say that the effect of that, it may not be a satanic conspiracy, but the result is practically the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not denying that there are cases in which there is deliberate suppression and conspiracies to hide things. I think that that also does happen. But in general, you know, if you looked at uh, most of the people that are participating in these professions, they wouldn't think no. that they are. 
Well, I mean, if your paradigm, like you were, you were describing, if you have accepted the premise that your paradigm represents the pinnacle of all human knowledge as it currently stands, and you guys are the experts, then anything outside of that or anyone else outside of that who doesn't have those credentials is they don't have access to to the right information. They don't have access to the truth and they're they're discredited right off the bat. Well, that's that's what they say. There are sociologists of science who have studied this phenomenon in detail. And uh, one thing that happened was, you know, these there are, uh, there are sociologists and of science, historians of science, and philosophers of science who have exposed all these things, like the myth of the expert. Hmm. It's not that, I mean, who makes them the experts? They're self-appointed. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, self-appointed experts. I mean, sociologists have really gotten into this. I mean, you know, sometimes they catch a lot of heat when it leaks out from, you know, the academic world into the general public, creating doubt and skepticism. Mm. But, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things I'm saying are things that have been thoroughly documented and pointed out by sociologists of science, philosophers of science, and historians of science for a long time. Yeah, it's 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 not new. Uh, it's not new, but it's it's becoming more and more uh, apparent to more and more people. I think, which is which is exactly what we need. Even some of the experts themselves have, uh, have spoken out against experts. The idea of experts. Uh, I quoted David Sackett um, in a recent uh, presentation about medicine and the way this this uh, censorship and knowledge filtration operates in the realm of, of medicine and and uh, that kind of that aspect of science um, or so called science. Um, maybe can we touch on some of the other really interesting things like, sure. um, for example, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Ribeiro and stone tools, millions of years old. Oh, that was, uh, discoveries that were made in Portugal in the 19th century. Carlos Ribeiro was the chief government, uh, geologist of Portugal in the mid to late uh, 19th century, you know, 1880s, 90s, like that. And in his country of Portugal, he found um, <clears throat> human artifacts, you know, stone tools and weapons and formations that were from the Miocene period, which goes from 5 million to 20 million years ago, basically. So he reported these things to the scientific world and uh, they didn't like it. So uh, the, he, there was, uh, he was the head of a scientific conference, a, a meeting of a an, associate, uh, an association of European archaeologists and anthropologists. They met in Lisbon, and he took them to the places where the discoveries had been made. Uh, one of the places was called Monte Redondo. So on the slopes of this mountain, you know, people had, scientists had made excavations where they found artifacts and layers of rock, you know, from the early Miocene period, which would be more towards 20 million years. And uh, there were skeptical scientists. So they all went out on an expedition during the conference, you know, during a, a break in the conference. They went out to Monte Redondo and they were looking around, conducting their little excavations, and uh, they found an artifact. It's, you know, it kind of demonstrated that, yeah, these things 
do exist and they're found in layers of rock 20 million years old. So the artifacts were on display in the Museum of Geology in Lisbon for a long time. And, but when Ribeiro died, his colleagues in the museum did something interesting. They left the artifacts on display, but they wrote new labels for them. You know, for example, there was uh, a flint uh, implement, pointed implement that uh, Ribeiro had found and given a date of uh, 20 million years on the label. I mean, he didn't say 20 million years. He said early Miocene, which uh, if we convert that to you know, the modern dating of the early Miocene goes back about 20 million years. So his colleagues thought, well, that's just impossible. Let's, let's call this... Um, late Paleolithic or something. Uh, in other words, about 20,000 years old instead of 20 million. So they wrote new labels for this artifact and the others that they left on display, giving them far younger ages than Ribeiro had given. And then the next generation of officials in the museum just put the entire collection away. So wow. uh, if you're not somebody like me, you wouldn't even suspect that these things exist. But I had gone through Ribeiro's reports and I knew they should be there somewhere. So I uh, approached, I, would, I went to Lisbon and I approached the museum officials and they say, yes, we do have them. And I went through the you know, different procedures that you have to go through in order to get access to things in a, a museum. You know, it turned out I was, I had proposed to the European Association of Archaeologists that I present a paper about these discoveries at a meeting they were going to have later in the year in Lisbon. You know, the European Association of Archaeologists meets in a different place every year in Europe. So that particular year, they were going to meet in Lisbon, and I got accepted to make this proposal. So I was able to go to the museum officials say, I've got a paper on these discoveries coming up. It's already been accepted by mm -hmm. the Academic Committee of the European Association of Archaeologists. I would like access to these artifacts in your collection, not displayed, but in the storerooms. So they gave it. I went to the museum and I was able to study and photograph these artifacts. I was also able to look at Ribeiro's original field notes and maps. And using that information, I was able to go out into the countryside of Portugal and relocate some of the sites where he had made these discoveries. So I did write a scientific paper. I did presented at uh, the meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists. And it was later published in a peer-reviewed uh, scientific journal that deals with the archaeology of the Iberian Peninsula, in other words, Spain and Portugal. So yeah, there, uh, there are things in the museums that aren't displayed and that nobody would even suspect are there unless you're somebody like me. Yeah, who's who's done the digging. 
Um, it's astonishing what they've, what some of these, as, there's so much hubris in, in what these guys have done to make things disappear. Just, you know, oh, no, that doesn't fit my belief system. No, we'll make that go away. Um, let's let's go a little further back in the, the timeline. There are, I know you've looked at 550 million year old uh, metal bars or vase and also 300 million year old human remains, Michael. Well, the 300 million year old human remains were reported in a, a scientific journal called The Geologist in the late 19th century. And the discoveries were made in uh, a location near St. Louis in the United States. And in, at this location, uh, an excavation was made that went 90 feet below the surface of the ground. And in that, that uh, uh, formation at that depth, uh, an anatomically modern human skeleton had been found. And directly above the skeleton, there was a thick layer of slate rock that extended very far in all directions. Now that's an important detail because the usual response from scientists committed to the current paradigm to a discovery like that would be to say, somehow or other, it slipped down from a higher level. There was some earth movement, something, a flood, something happened, and it was washed down there or slipped down there. And the fact that there was this unbroken layer of rock above the 90 foot level where the skeleton was found kind of rules out all those kinds of counter explanations. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of interesting because the usual scientific response to discoveries of evidence for extreme human antiquity is to give a list of possibilities how things could have gone wrong. Yeah. In other words, now that's not a very scientific way to proceed. If you're going to claim that, you have to pick out which one you say happened and prove it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because you can give a list of possibilities of how things could be wrong. Yeah, you know, for example, in, once I was giving a lecture in Copenhagen in Denmark, and I was talking about some of these cases, and an archaeologist from the university there had come to the meeting, and during the question session, he uh, began to list. Say, well, I mean, what he did is he said, "Well, Mr. Cremo, uh, you pre presented some interesting cases here, but don't you realize that the discoverer could have made a mistake? There could have been earth movements. There could have been, uh, you know, there was a fissure." up at the top and there were some artifacts on the surface and they slipped down into that very ancient layer or it could be a hoax and i said to him you could be a holographic projection from mars <laughs> you know i mean if you want to list possibilities but that's not a, a, a scientific response no. Yeah, just to give a list of ways in which things could be wrong. Of course, they could be wrong. Yeah. The question is, did it happen? You know, be specific. What do you, What exactly is your exact explanation for this discovery? Mm. And demonstrate that the situation that you propose explains it is itself explained by you. 
Yeah. So I, I think that that it's a it's an interesting sort of statement on the the psychology of the the, the scientist who adheres to that mainstream paradigm because. From where they're standing, maybe not on a conscious level, but unconsciously, it's like they're at the top of the mountain and they don't have to justify themselves because they're, they've got the paradigm, they've got the answers. So they can just throw out these hypotheticals. It could have been a mistake. It could have been, it could have been, you know, the devil could have planted it there. And they feel like on some level they can get away with that, it seems. It's sort of disenabling um, that paradigm, it seems to enable this and support this hubris, which continues to hold back the the progress of, of information as someone like you is more, knows better than almost yeah. anybody else. Uh, uh, another example of that once I was, yeah, my books have been translated into a lot of different languages. One of them is Russian. So some time ago I was invited to on a lecture tour of Russia, I went all over the country I was invited to give a talk at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. I spoke to their anthropology and archaeology department. And after the lecture, one of the archaeologists said, I haven't read your book, but I'm sure that everything in it is a hoax, <laughs> a mistake, or an illusion. Wow. <laughs> you know, I haven't read the book. I've heard what you said. I haven't read it, but I'm sure that everything, every single case that you talk about is a mistake, <laughs> illusion, or hoax. So yes. for me, doing the research on the archaeology was only part of it. Experiencing directly the knowledge filtering process and operation, you know, as in that case, I just talked about the Russian Academy of Sciences or what the scientists, the archeologists said to me after my lecture in Copenhagen or any of these other cases that I mentioned. Actually, that's another type of research, seeing actually seeing these things happen, you learn a lot, you know, like by actually going out into those circles and presenting to them, presenting this kind of information to them, you see in real time, you know, how the knowledge filtration process really plays out so that was a, another type of research yeah you could say it's hard not to draw a parallel with the uh the old priesthood which kept the you know the bible to themselves and wouldn't let the the peasant masses have access to it just in case they you know read it for themselves and interpreted it themselves yeah uh yeah i, I think there are people who have made analogies to like it being a priesthood mm. yes it's sort of you know the way you described it definitely sounds more rather than a series of conspiracies to suppress valid information it sounds more like a comedy of errors uh, yeah but as i said it's something that's been widely recognized by the scholars who actually study science, mm. as I said, the historians of science, philosophers of science, sociologists of science, they've all, in, in their different manners for their different disciplines, have presented the idea that theoretical preconceptions influence how scientists react to different categories of evidence that come to their attention and <clears throat> um, uh, I think among the, the science science community and the academic community I see basically three kinds of reactions to my work from three different groups one group 
I call the fundamentalist materialists. And they're committed to the current theories and paradigms for reasons that are more ideological than purely scientific. Mm -hmm. In other words, they have some prior commitment to materialism or atheism or something that just makes them totally unwilling to listen to anything that I might say. You know, they don't want to hear it. Sometimes they'll cancel lectures that I've been scheduled to give at universities uh, sometimes. And they, they don't want anyone else to hear it either. You know, so they're very much opposed to it. Not so much on scientific grounds, but no. ideological grounds. And they're a prominent group in the world of science and the academic world. Mm. And there's another group, probably even more numerous. This concludes part one of the show. You'll find part two and related materials in my members-only portal, The Truthiversity, the consciousness-raising university. This creation is the official home for all my multimedia research and entertainment content. Updated regularly, my members get access to absolutely everything I create, including full podcasts, videos, blogs, courses, audio files, live internal events, the whole enchilada. Grab yourself a free 24-hour pass at access.truthiversity.com.